people. We love to make things. To do it yourself. To DIY. In the attic, the basement, the backyard, and in front of a camera. And those camera DIYers, they've got something you'll like. From the TV studio to the studio apartment, they're making something up just for you. It's That DIY Show. Today, it's picture perfect. Alex Hader helps us make a picture perfect book box. And Viewer's Choice shares some pro golf tips. Well, that sounds a bit fishy, but I like your question. Food coloring and watch the magic begin. <laughs> a volcanic science project, a hot tip from the hive mind, and going behind the scenes with a master luthier. I repair any kind of stringed instrument, so it's important for people that own these instruments to look after them. Handmade guitars, homemade lava lamps, and more. But first, we're off to the loft on that DIY show. Thanks for watching, I'm Alex Hader. I've got a beautiful little upcycling project for you. From a tree to a bookcase, now another transformation. Out of respect to its years of service, I'm going to be turning this bookcase into a book box. But first, get yourself a hot drink. I'm gonna tear this thing apart. Got my trusty mallet here. Looks like the back is just attached with brad nails, so that should come off pretty easily. That was really strong, I can rip it apart, but I'm not. So I think I can just, woo, one down. Do this all day. Somebody didn't use glue. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. Oh, <laughs> oh, too much muscle on that one. in the heavens. Oh, okay, got him. Amazing things are going to come from this destruction. Got lots of nice wood here. Just gonna think now, what is my next move gonna be? This book box is going to be about eight by six, so I definitely don't need all of this wood. I have to head over to the bandsaw to do some resawing. I have to get a piece of this wood down to about the thickness of a book cover. This piece would be great for the frame of the book box. Just gotta get a few screws out and I think I've got my pieces. Oh, yeah. Two nice clean pieces of wood. This piece that's going to be the frame, I'm gonna cut the top and the bottom off so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, also, these two sides are gonna get ripped so I just have to sand the front and the back. It's not coming off easy. My hands are vibrating and it tickles. It feels really weird. <laughs> All right, table saw, chop saw, band saw, all the saws. I'm coming for you. I've got all the pieces for my book box and it's starting to look like a book. You can see this piece here. Looks like the pages of the book. You can see this thin piece. Looks like the front of a book or the back, either one. And the coolest piece, this is where the hinge is gonna be and it looks like the spine of a book. I've got my fast drying wood glue, whole lot of clamps. Gonna need those, but the glue's gonna do the trick. I don't need any bride nails. Obviously, I'm not gonna be screwing anything together. So this should come together pretty quickly. I just have to be accurate. Oh, and <laughs> watch where you're gluing. You can spread it out with your finger. Now, I'm gonna clamp this down until it dries. It's <laughs> a lot of clamps. I don't think I've ever used this many clamps. 
I'm just gonna wait for this to dry and then I'm going to be moving on to the top of the box. The lid. I'm going to start gluing this together now, but I've got a pro tip. I've got the salt. And what I'm gonna do is put some glue on, use the finger to spread it out, then grab a pinch of salt, I'm gonna sprinkle it on, and then I'm gonna glue it on because the salt is going to create a little bit of friction on here, so it's not gonna move around as much when I try to clamp it down. Salt worked like a charm. That just made the clamping process so much easier. I highly recommend that. Now I have to glue the lid of the box slash cover of the book to the hinge. Same old story. Got to put the glue on the hinge. Rub it in with your finger. And then, it's pretty easy. I'm gonna use this cute little clamp. Clamp it together and we wait 10 minutes. Check out my blue felt. It's a nice royal blue, one of my faves. And this is going to be for the inside of my book box. I'm gonna cut it 11 by eight and a half. I'm gonna make four cuts in each corner, diagonal cuts. And that's when we put it in the box, it stays nice and tight on each corner. The big test, does it open? It's a little sticky, but just a little wear. It'll, oh, there we see. It's just the initial open. <laughs> we are doing good now. Okay. I'm just gonna cut in from the corners. Fabric glue. Get this stuff in the corners. That's probably the most important area. Keep it going all around. And you're just gonna push down. So you wanna make sure that uh, your cuts that you made into the fabric go right into the corners of the box. After you've really dug into the corners there, I'm just gonna cut most of the excess off of the felt. Now once that dries, just trim it up as clean as you can. And while that happens, I can work on the lid. Glue's all dried up, so now it's time to make the edges clean and pretty. It's finished, I love it. I've got a rustic look on the go here, but of course, you can do whatever you want with this. You know, you can paint it, you can bedazzle it, put jewels on it, you can write your favorite book title on it, you can sign it. The options are pretty much endless with this book box. You can do whatever you want. The only thing I think I would have done differently is I would have put the felt in before I attached the top and the bottom. It just would have been a lot easier to cut in here. It's so cute. This little book box made from upcycled materials. It's picture perfect. We've got hands and we've got plans. What more do you need? It's That DIY Show.
from bright ideas all the way to dark workshops. It's That DIY Show. Ready transmission. Do it all by myself, Lava Lamp. Hi. Have you guys ever seen lava? Like, real lava? You know, the oozy stuff that slides down the volcanoes. It's so cool! Well, actually, it's super hot, but whatever. Imagine making your very own red hot lava spewing volcano for your bedroom! I'm not talking about any store-bought lava lamp. I'm gonna show you how to make your own using an old mason jar and some baking supplies that you probably have lying around your house. Let's get cooking. All you'll need is a tiny LED light, cooking oil, food coloring, baking soda, and vinegar. Oh yeah, and you're gonna need some tools. You're definitely gonna need some tools. You'll need some handy dandy clamps, a hole saw, a measuring tape, and my square. First, we'll work this paduke down into a nifty base to hold our light. We'll put the jar on top of the light, fill it up with baking soda, vinegar, and oil. Then, of course, we will add the food coloring and watch the magic begin. <laughs> It's simple and super cool, and I have all the tools to make it happen. Let's do it. I have my sacrificial board and my paduk that I will be clamping down to the table and taking this hole saw to drill a hole for our light. Woo! It looks like I got to the bottom. Yeah! Nice. That's a mighty fine hole if I do say so myself. Now I'll take my piece of wood without the hole and glue it to the one with the hole. This looks really cool. Now that they are glued together, we'll have a little inlay for our light. Well, this dries, I guess I could clean up. That doesn't mean. Haven't you seen my place? It's spotless. <laughs> ah, perfect. All clean. I'm gonna go with red. Or blue. Nah, I'm gonna stick with red. Now for the hardest part. <gasps> <gasps> In a tiny vessel filled with vinegar, we will add our food coloring and toss it into the mason jar. We will add the baking soda. That looks like a nice mount. Fill the rest of the mason jar with oil. I have this very cute jar for my vinegar vessel. You should add about an ounce to the mason jar. Then of course, we will add the food coloring. As the old saying goes, if you don't know how much to put in, put in all of it. They used to say that back in my day, I think. Now, the moment of trout. I'm gonna put this guy onto our base and our light. And now I'm going to add my vinegar! Wow, it's starting to work. For this masterpiece to be truly appreciated, we'll need to have the lights off. People, turn off the lights! Okay. Thank you. Wow, that is an 
awesome experiment. And of course, to cap this project off, <laughs> we'll put on the cap. Wow, this is pretty groovy. Should probably put some music on. Everyone can create, but we can all use a little bit of inspiration. It's That DIY Show. Hey, viewers' choice. I was playing around a golf the other day, and tempers flared, things happened, and long story short, now I got a couple of bent clubs. I was thinking that this might be something that was good for an upcycling project. Do you have any ideas? That sounds a bit fishy, but I like your question. I just happen to have a few bent clubs lying around the shop myself. That's what I'm talking about. For these trash club heads, I have a simple little hat rack design that will look perfect in your entryway. And all we need to pull it off is a piece of wood, some sticky epoxy, and a little bit of wipe on poly. All right, obviously this board is way too long, so we're gonna have to chop it down. Two feet will do. We're gonna jazz up the edges a little bit. Now you could router them down, you could break them with a block plane, but I'm gonna go ahead and chamfer them off with my table saw. Four broken clubs, and a backboard that will mount on the wall. And four broken clubs. I need four holes. I'm gonna find center, which is at 12 inches, and I'm gonna go two and a quarter inches for our first two holes and then four and a half from that. Easy. One club, two, three, four. You have to measure the diameter of the broken shaft of the golf club in order to know what size hole you need to make in your board. You know, you don't have to be exactly right, but mine looks like it's about three eighths of an inch. So that's the hole I'm gonna go with. If you're uncomfortable with the drill press, you can always clamp your board to the surface before making your hole. I drilled my holes about a half inch deep. I didn't want to go all the way through, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Sanding achieves three things. It gets rid of the burrs created from drilling out the holes. It gets rid of all my pencil mark, and it opens up the grains so it can accept this poly better. So I'm just gonna pour it on the wood and rub it in with this rag. And you'll see that it gives the grain a nice shine and really makes this oak pop. Let's cut some clubs. So I've marked one inch in from the head of the iron with a piece of tape. That was way easier than breaking them. We got our four clubs cut to length and now it's time to put them in the holes. To do that, I'll use some sticky epoxy resin. Putting a little bit extra epoxy on the club itself just to make sure we get a really secure fit. And now I'm just gonna use a rag to wipe up any extra epoxy. It's time to mount it up. It worked. We have all these great tools in this workshop, but you don't need all of that to tackle any of these projects at home. So if you're looking for inspiration, track down the Viewer's Choice team on the streets and submit your question. I'm always happy to help out. Around the world and right around the corner, DIYers and master crafters have something to show and a story to tell. I'm Zane O'Brien. I build electric guitars and basses. I've always been a woodworker. I was a woodworker long before I was a luthier. As a luthier, I have to know how to repair any kind of stringed instrument. It matters to musicians to know that they can get their guitar fixed and serviced and looked after. Many, many musicians over the years, and, uh, I try to give them reassurance that they're in good hands when they leave their instrument here.
I'm a fairly average guitar player, but I admire guys who can play really well because they've got a natural talent. I figure I was born with a, a natural talent to build guitars and to work on them and service them. It's just something that comes natural to me. I got into building guitars back in 1988, and I was playing in the band. After I built my friend in the band a, a couple of guitars, I started being the designated guitar tech for the band, and today my necks are better than factory. In a factory, the guy could say, ha, that's gonna be Joe's job down in the assembly line. Let him worry about it. I can't do that. I have to say I gotta fix that because that's not right. The devil lives in the detail. Sometimes I even have a customer come over to the shop and be here while I'm doing it so that they can pick the neck up and put it in their hands and feel it. They can see what it looked like from the very beginning, at least birth, you could say, to a finished instrument that they now own and play. And, and a lot of the musicians that have those guitars would never sell them because they, they love them. This machine here is a stroke sander. Down here we've got a thickness planer, a jointer, which is used for joining the edge of boards, a shaper. This machine's used for shaping wood. People ask all the time, how long does it take to make a guitar? Anywhere from 30 hours to 50, 60 hours, it really depends. It's really important to know your playing style and, and know what's best for you as a player, because every setup isn't the same for every player. Most musicians can pick up a guitar and within five seconds will know whether they like that neck or not because it's like putting on a pair of shoes. It makes a difference between fighting the instrument and enjoying playing it. It's a real challenge to make a neck that feels good. They're very sensitive instruments. I always try to do the very best I can possibly do. I'm my own worst enemy because the standard that I follow is my own standard. I'm, I've kind of elevated my demands based on what I like and what I would expect. Guitars are not like a saxophone. A saxophone never changes, but a guitar does because it's made out of wood. That's why when large groups go on the road, they have a guitar tech. Humidity changes as they go along on their tour, and that could affect the way they play on stage and affect the whole concert. So it's important for people that own these instruments to look after them, and that's where I come in. So there's well over 300 guitars out there that are got the legend name on them. That's what I do.